some ideas. Obviously, if you're in Nebraska, write in the name of Dan Burdoff for United States Senate. If you're in California, five, James Hinton for Congress. Pull the lever. In Wisconsin, defeat Walker. That means vote for Burke. That's all you can do. Get Walker out. Kansas, get Brown back out. Uh, in Michigan, get Snyder out. Vote for Shower. In Illinois, boy, if you don't want Illinois to become a right-to-work state uh, on the model of what Walker Snyder has succeeded, Kasich hasn't quite succeeded, but they'll try that in Illinois. So keep Quinn and not the other alternative. Uh, in Arkansas, Pryor, this guy Cotton, voted against the Pandemic uh, Preparedness Act. Get him out. Hagen over Tillis in North Carolina. Tillis uh, wrecking the economic model of North Carolina with his education cuts in South Dakota. Give Larry Pressler a try, right? He's a loose cannon. He's a wild card. Let's see what he can do. Uh, in Kentucky, this McConnell uh, has outlived his usefulness. Grimes is better. And I would just say from a purely technical point of view, Grimes is a uh, very disciplined, a model of a disciplined candidate. Whatever you think of the content, I'm critical of most of our content. But that iron will of discipline, that's a model for many a political uh, campaigner. Scott Brown drives a truck. <laughs> that was that was the hog castration of uh, a couple of years ago. Well, he drives a truck. He's a delivery man for the policies of Wall Street, especially the State Street Bank. So you get the idea. Pretty much vote against the Koch candidates. That's generally the Republican. And uh, try to avoid the worst. Uh, in the meantime, there are some places, right? Right now, Nebraska and California 5, and then we're going to talk about New York State. You probably want to vote for Howie Hawkins, uh, if only because he supports the a certain version, at least, of the Wall Street sales tax and keep that uh, alive. So uh, those are the evil clowns of this uh, thank you this uh, Halloween season. Now, second point, the um, international uh, questions. Um, U.S. Uh, policy is obviously in disarray, right? There is this bifurcation, right? Supporting terrorism. If you're a terrorist in Iraq, uh, well, this has now changed a little bit, but uh, the point is the parts of the U.S. government support ISIS, Parts of the U.S. alliance system, the Saudis, the Turks, support uh, the uh, ISIS people. But then there's also the need to bomb them for public relations reasons. It is, of course, time to deliver ultimata to Turkey. Stop supporting ISIS to Saudi Arabia. Stop supporting ISIS to the Israelis. We've just had the Israeli foreign minister writing in uh, the New York Times that um, uh, the um, the uh, may, that it, the ISIS is no threat at all to the Israelis. That uh, Syria needs to be carved into pieces, uh, and so forth. Right. So there's a huge crisis in the U.S.-Israeli alliance. Right. The guano reference, I guess we'd have to call it, um, from somebody in the State Department, and that goes together with a crisis in the U.S.-Turkish. Alliance, which found its way even onto the front page of the Washington Post. And we're told by that same Washington Post that the um, sociopaths of half the world are streaming into Syria. Fighters are still flocking to Syria. Strikes have not stemmed the flow. Overall numbers rise in a steady migration. That's Friday, October 31st today. Halloween. Uh, now, behind the scenes, the strains of all this are becoming uh, quite uh, obvious. The New York Times uh, speculates uh, that um, there may be a purge. And the starting point for this is uh, the Hagel Memorandum from Chuck Hagel, Secretary of Defense, to Susan Rice, the National Security Director. Right? She's supposed to coordinate the government. She's a miserable failure. Um, essentially, the idea is that U.S. 
uh, policy in Syria is unraveling U.S. policy in Syria because, gosh, if you try to attack ISIS, you're going to be helping Assad and you don't want to do that. And we've got the think tank community here, uh, some very ugly people. Anthony Cordesman, a strange love who came into the fore really 25 years ago in the first Gulf War, right, the Kuwait War. Uh, he says that this is a strategic mess. Yeah, well, um, that's what happens when you back terrorism and try to use it as a geopolitical tool. So the idea is that Hegel is still in office and he's joining Gates, Panetta, Hillary and Dempsey, really, in uh, criticizing Obama's current policy. Boy, uh, something has to be done uh, there. But you see the uh, the problem. And the real problem, of course, is the New York Times is speculating that if there is a purge, right, Kerry is seen as untethered. He's off the reservation half the time. Hegel doesn't say anything, at least not in meetings. He only talks to Obama one-on-one. -on -one. But you've got now these czars moving in. General Allen, remember him, the great friend of Jill Kelly down there in Tampa, and he was ousted as part of the Petraeus purge post-Benghazi. Allen coming back in? Is he going to come back all the way and take over Kerry's job or Hagel's job? And then, of course, we've got the Ebola czar clean. Um, notice also, Chief of Staff McDonough um, seems to be uh, still around. And, uh, of course, Susan uh, Rice. So uh, the idea is that uh, the instability is becoming overwhelming. And you can see this also with the Turkey and Israeli uh, alliance crises. Now, I would like to do justice to the... Uh, Valdai speech by Vladimir Putin of Russia, uh, that is something you're going to want to read in detail. And it's worth pondering because it does show you how somebody else sees this entire thing. And it's it's full of uh, important insights. Let's just give some kind of a flavor. The United States declared itself the winner of the Cold War, so no need to readjust the international system. Uh, but uh, simply took steps that threw the system into sharp and deep imbalance. Right? Bring back the balance. Pardon the analogy, but this is the way a nouveau riche behaves when suddenly given a great fortune. In this case, world leadership and world domination. Instead of managing their wealth wisely, they commit many follies. We'll see if we can say a little bit more about this in a minute on World Crisis Radio. <laughs> States in just a minute, but uh, the Putin Valdai speech. Um, the U.S. has committed many follies, says Putin to this international gathering. Uh, the measures taken against those who refuse to submit are well known, tried and tested many times, including. Use of force, economic and propaganda pressure, meddling in domestic affairs, and appeals to a kind of super, super legal legitimacy to justify illegal intervention in this or that conflict or toppling of inconvenient uh, regimes. Uh, outright blackmail has been used against a number of leaders. I would also point to the tragic death of de la Margerie, the head of the French Total um, Petroleum Company, right? a great enemy of sanctions on Ukraine and a great advocate of uh, European East-West uh, EU to Russia uh, economic inter integration. Um, a universal diktat by the United States imposing one's own models produces the opposite result – Instead of settling conflicts, it leads to their escalation. Instead of sovereign and stable states, we see the growing spread of chaos instead of democracy. And the U.S. supports a very dubious public ranging from open neo-fascists, 
parenthesis Ukraine, to Islamic radicals, parenthesis ISIS. And how, what is, how's the track record on that? First, there was the military operation in Iraq, then Libya. Libya pushed to the brink of falling apart. Why? Today, the country is in danger of breaking up and has become a training ground for terrorists. It's one of the main sources for ISIS. We have to point out, though, that Tunisia, as the Washington Post notes, is one of the biggest uh, national <laughs> delegations, if you will, inside of uh, ISIS. Uh, now, the economic sanctions specifically, and Putin on that, sanctions are undermining the foundations of world trade, including the WTO rules and the inviolability of private property. They are dealing a blow to the liberal model of globalization based on markets, freedom, and competition, uh, which has benefited the Western countries. Parenthesis, we here condemn that model from the word go. It's inherently unworkable, and Putin needs to go further on that kind of a point. Um, however, why... Did the U.S. do all these things? United States prosperity rests to a large degree on the trust of investors and foreign holders of dollars and securities, U.S. securities. The trust is being undermined and the signs of disappointment in the fruits of globalization are now visible in many countries. You've got the Cyprus precedent, right, stealing money out of uh, bank accounts, Um the trend is now towards seeking to bolster economic and financial sovereignty by countries or regional groups to protect themselves from outside pressure. More and more countries are looking for ways to become less dependent on the dollar and are setting up alternative financial and payment systems and reserve currencies. I think our American friends are quite simply cutting the branch that they're sitting on. You cannot mix politics and ec economics in this way, but that is what they are doing. Politically motivated sanctions are a mistake that will harm everyone. And at the same time, the American colleagues tried to manage these processes using regional conflicts and color revolutions to suit their interests. But the genie is out of the bottle. And specifically on Ukraine, he says, how can you try to move Ukraine into the European Union over a process of months, um, Russia remains Ukraine's main trading partner. And when you look at Russia, Russia wanted to join the World Trade Organization. Again, I would dissent on the advisability of that. But the Rus Russian ac accession to the World Trade Organization lasted for 19 years and it was only in that process that some kind of a consensus was reached. So Yan Yanukovych would have given the West everything they wanted. Why oust him? And Putin says he has asked his uh, negotiating partners, there is no answer. That's it. They're all at a loss. It just turned out that way. There is, in the course of the speech, a detailed uh, recapitulation from Putin's point of view of what happened in Ukraine last February and uh, around the same uh, times. So the, again, the Western method is, uh, to use these, these methods. Those who constantly throw together new color revolutions consider themselves brilliant artists and simply cannot stop, right? Maybe that's Newland, although certainly her temperament is anything but, uh, artistic. President Obama, he goes on, spoke about the Islamic State as one of the threats. But who helped to arm the people who were fighting Assad in Syria? Who created a favorable political and information climate for them? Who pushed for arms supplies? Are you really not aware of who is fighting there? It is mostly mercenaries fighting there. Are you not aware that they get paid to fight? And they go wherever they get paid the most. So they get weapons and they get paid for fighting. I have heard how much they get paid. Once they're armed and paid for their services, you can't just undo all that. I hope McCain, hope McCain, Walnuts McCain, are you listening? Then they hear that they can get more money elsewhere. And so they go there and they capture oil fields in Iraq and Syria and start producing oil and others buy this oil. Why are sanctions not imposed on those engaged in such activities? Cutter, I'm adding Cutter, Turkey, Saudi Arabia. 
Doesn't the United States know who is responsible? Isn't it their own allies who are doing this? Don't they have the power and the opportunity to influence their allies? Or do they not want to? But then why are they bombing the Islamic State if they haven't used these other methods? This is pretty much what we've been saying here for some uh, months. Then ISIS started producing oil and were able to pay more. And some of the rebels fighting for the so-called civilized opposition rushed off to join the Islamic State because they pay better. This is very short-sighted and incompetent has no basis in reality. We've heard that they we need to support civilized democratic opposition in Syria, and so they get support and they get weapons. And the next day, half the rebels went off and joined the Islamic State. Was it so hard to foresee that possibility a little bit earlier? We are opposed to this kind of U.S. policy. We believe it is misguided, harmful to everyone, including to you. Bravo, Putin. And concerning Libya, what was the result in Libya? Your ambassador was killed. This is a little bit of shorthand, but the idea is clear. Who's to blame? You blame yourself. Was that a good thing for the United States with your ambassador killed? It was a terrible thing, a terrible tragedy. You should not look for scapegoats if you are the ones who made the mistakes. On the contrary, you need to overcome the desire to always dominate and act on your imperial ambitions. You need to stop poisoning the minds of millions of people with the idea that U.S. policy can only be a policy of imperial ambition. Okay, so those are some of the many highlights of this fascinating thing. There's a lengthy question and answer. There are also interventions that you can hear from Dominique de Villepin, right, our favorite French politician, You remember Dominique de Villepin couldn't get on the ballot because he couldn't get enough signatures from French mayors because the Cheminade people, the LaRouche tentacle in France, had gone out and gotten those signatures from those mayors in advance. And that meant that they were not any more available for de Villepin. So who who benefited from that little caper? Wasn't that... Something like U.S. intelligence or the CIA. So that was Le Farfelu at the time. And also there was Wolfgang Schussel of Austria. Back in a minute now on World Crisis Radio.